Good morning, friends. It's good to see you all this morning, and it's good to have those of you who are joining us on WTYE or are watching on live stream or YouTube to, to join us this morning as well. Uh, today's radio broadcast has been uh, sponsored by an anonymous donor as well as our beautiful altar flowers today, and we are very grateful for your gifts. We do want to remind folks uh, that we are having Vacation Bible School coming up uh, the week of July 12th through the 16th. Um, and we're offering a couple of different options for folks to come to that. Um, it's for students that have finished kindergarten through fifth grade. Um, and we'll have a, a slot that's from 9 to 10.30 in the morning. And then we'll have another slot that's available from 2 until 3.30 in the afternoon. So you can register for one of those two options, or you can register if you'd like to join us by Zoom. We had some great folks who joined us from like Nebraska and Kentucky for Vacation Bible School last year because we were able to do that, and so we're going to offer both of those as an option, but we do ask that you register ahead of time. Uh, that registration form is available in our e-news, um, and it's also available on our website, I believe. Brennan's given me the sign that says yes, that it's available there, so we would love to have you join us. We'd also like to know a little early if you can let us know that you're planning to participate so we can make sure we have all of the supplies that we need, but we're really excited to be able to welcome our kids back uh, to our facility for Vacation Bible School this summer. Also want to remind folks uh, that Lori Treadway's class, she's teaching a class on the Holy Spirit uh, on Tuesday evenings uh, this summer, uh, and that begins this week. Is that right? At 6.30? Um, and folks have already signed up to be a part of that. I believe you got 14 people that are in your class, 14 or 15. Would you take any more? anymore, anytime. So if you're really interested in being a part of that, that's happening in Asbury Hall. It'll also be available on Zoom. So if you need to participate from home, you are welcome to do that um, as we move into more of a hybrid mode around here. So we're excited about that. I'm also excited to tell you that the, for the first, I think this is the first time in seven years that Susan Inboden has been the liturgist. And I'm really excited to hear what God is going to say through her today. But we're also very grateful Doug Finkbeiner is going to be uh, singing and he's going to be helping with song leading while Angie is uh, recuperating at home this week. And Yvonne Newland is here again playing for Brenda while she's on vacation. And we are grateful for your presence as well. So let's uh, give God a hand clap of praise for those who are serving <laughs> among us today. I want to invite those of you who are here to stand as you're able and to join with me in our call to worship this morning. Jesus calls us from the everyday places of our lives. God has work for us to do. Jesus wants us to follow and fish for people. God has work for us to do. Our songs of praise this morning, you'll find them projected, are all go anywhere and welcome.
Let's walk together for a while and ask where we begin to build a world where love can grow and hope can enter in. To me, your hands are healing and to plant the seed of Singing, welcome, welcome to this place. You're invited to come and know God's grace. The love welcome, the love of God to share. Cause all of us are welcome here. All are welcome in this place. Let's talk together all the time when we will share a feast where pride and power kneel to serve the lonely and the least. And joy will set the table as we join. Let's dream together of a day when earth and heaven are one. A city built of love and light, the new Jerusalem, where our morning turns to dancing. Every creature lives. 
You may be seated. And kids, it's your time. All right, you don't have to come up, but you do have to talk really loud. Do you think you can talk really loud for me? Okay. I would like to know what your favorite thing is to do in the whole wide world. Gianna, what's your favorite thing to do? Gymnastics. And Kevin, what's your favorite thing to do? Okay, riding your dirt bike. Let's see. Uh, Lainey. Swimming. Lucas? What? Eating cake? Is that what you said? Eating cake? Okay. And Brenna? Cake? Okay. What if you were doing your very favorite thing and mom or dad told you you had to stop? How many of you would stop? Okay. Well, Lucas, I think I would probably have a hard time stopping eating cake, too. That makes a lot of sense, right? Yeah, sometimes it's really hard for us to stop doing something that we love, isn't it? Adults, is that true, too? It's hard to quit doing something that we love when someone asks us not to do that. Well, guess what? Today we're talking about a time when Jesus was with his... uh, he, He didn't even have disciples, Yet, but he was walking on the shore of a lake, and guess what? He saw some people who were out fishing, and that was something that they loved to do. Do you know anybody who loves to fish? Okay, do we have maybe parents or grandparents or aunts or uncles who love to fish? Yeah, yeah. And they were out doing fishing, and that was their job, but it was also something that they loved. And you know what Jesus said to them? Come follow me. How many of you think that they left their nets and they followed him? We're thinking about it. We're checking to see what other people have to say. Okay, so we're almost half and a half. Well, guess what? They left their nets. They threw them down in the water and they got out of their boats and they went and they followed Jesus. Do you think that that would have been hard to stop doing something that you love to do? in order to follow Jesus? What if I said, Gianna, that you had to give up doing gymnastics, that you couldn't do gymnastics anymore if you were going to follow Jesus? Would that be hard? Do you think you'd try to do it anyway? Yeah. What if you had to give up your dirt bike? Do you think you could do it? That'd be hard. Well, we know Lucas can't give up cake, right? That'd be too hard to do. But some disciples, they had a really hard time with the things that Jesus asked them to do. And sometimes we have a hard time doing the things that Jesus asks us to do as well. But we have to remember that when Jesus calls us and tells us that we are to do something that as hard as it might be to stop doing what we're doing right now, we need to go ahead and we need to follow him and do what he asks us to do and go where he tells us to go. Can we pray? God, we thank you for the favorite things that we have in our lives that we love to do, the places that we love to go. But we also know that you call us first and foremost to follow your son, Jesus. And so help us to sometimes, when it's hard, to let go of the things that we love because we love you even more. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Now, if you would all join me in the prayer of illumination. Lord, we know that you have a call for all of our lives, but we sometimes struggle to know what it is. Sometimes you want us to do what seems impossible, and sometimes you want us to do what seems ordinary. Speak to us today and help us to go where you call us and do what you ask of us. Amen. And our scripture reading this morning is taken from the book of Matthew, chapter 4. I'll be reading verses 18 through 25. Jesus calls the first disciples. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, 
Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. And then Jesus ministers to crowds of people. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all the sick, those who were afflicted with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, and paralytics, and he cured them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. And now, Doug Klingbinder will be bringing us a special. Oh, to have seen it, to see those in need of healing coming forward, to have seen the fishermen attending their nets, and seen the mighty storm quell. In fancy I stood by the shore one day of the beautiful murmuring sea. I saw the great crowds as they thronged the way of the stranger of Galilee. I saw how the man who was blind from birth in a moment was made to see the lame was made whole by the matchless skill of the stranger of Galilee. I heard him speak peace to the angry waves of that turbulent raging sea. And lo, at his word, the water still, this stranger of Galilee. A quiet, a peaceful and holy calm. Now and ever abide with me. My life is held in his mighty hands. This stranger of Galilee. And I felt I could love him forever. So gracious and tender 
was he. I claimed him that day as my Savior. The stranger, he's no stranger. But the Savior of Doug, I was thinking about where your parents used to sit and how proud they would have been um, to watch you and to listen to you sing this morning as they would have been back there. And it reminds me that I should say Happy Father's Day to everybody who is a father who's with us and those who act like fathers to us. And we are grateful for you and for your lives. All of us are students, wouldn't you say? And we're all studying for goals. Colby, what's your goal right now? Do you want to get out of high school? <laughs> Sooner than later, right? Yes. And Allison, we know you went to school to be a teacher. You didn't fall far from your mother's footsteps, didn't learn anything from all her years of teaching, right? That you shouldn't do that, right? All of us had a goal, even when we were young, we wanted to get through our schooling, we wanted to go and to, to do all of those things. Maybe you wanted to learn a trade and so you want to do an apprenticeship. Maybe you got your license to teach or to preach or maybe even to practice law. And every one of us who has set a goal like that has poured lots of time and lots of effort into learning our craft. So what is it that happens when everything turns upside down for us and we no longer are able to do what it is that we said we wanted to do? We aren't traveling very far today. As you look at your map up here, you'll see uh, that we were right next to the Sea of Galilee last week in Capernaum, and right now we are, are just south of that. We were on the seashore, and now we're at this great Sea of Galilee. It's also been known as Lake Tiberias or Lake Gennesaret, and it covers about 64 square miles. It's about 13 miles long and about 11 miles wide, and at its deepest, it's 157 feet deep. It's fed primarily by the Jordan River, and it's surrounded by plains, it's surrounded by hills, and it's beautiful country, as you can see. The Sea of Galilee is surrounded by these mountains on one side, there are plains on the other side, and for centuries, even millennia, the major employment centered around nature. There was agriculture that took place in the plains, and that still continues to this day. But fishing was an important industry, as you can imagine, on this particular sea. Um, and some of the fish that you can find in the Sea of Galilee are damselfish and catfish and mouth breeders, and there are sardines, uh, a whole bunch of stuff that I would never put my hands on, but, you know, to each their own. Uh, but as you see these pictures, you can think about the fact that these were careers that people learned and that they apprenticed for centuries to be able to go out and to, to fish in this particular way. These days, we do most of our fishing by rod and reel, correct? But that's not the way that it was back then. They would have taken nets and they would have cast the nets out of the boat and brought them up and hoped that they would get a great catch. And the Sea of Galilee was a great place for Jesus' ministry. We know that he preached his sermon on the mount on those hills that were at the edge of the lake. This was the place where he taught his disciples 
to pray the Lord's Prayer. There are lots of coastal cities that exist here uh, where Jesus did a lot of his ministry. And so it's no surprise that Jesus chooses this place to begin his public ministry. From Capernaum, Jesus began to, to spread this message. He said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has drawn near. Now imagine hearing that message said today, and it's probably one that we need to hear more often than we do that we need to repent because the kingdom of heaven has, has drawn near. And so Jesus is going out, and this is what he is saying to the people. And as we know, news about Jesus travels quickly. Jesus is walking by the sea, as we hear this morning's passage. And he's probably proclaiming this message as he goes along the shoreline. And out in the water, he sees Simon, who we know as Peter, and Andrew and Simon and Peter are brothers and they're, they're fishing, they're taking their nets and they're throwing them over the side of the boat and casting them into the sea. They're, they're out there doing what they were trained to do. And Jesus says to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately, immediately, they threw off their nets, they got out of the boat, and they went, and they followed him. Now, continuing his journey along this shoreline of this Galilean lake, Jesus encounters two more brothers, known as James and John, and we know that they are the sons of Zebedee. They're found in their boat, and they are mending their nets. So they're not actively fishing at this point in time. They're getting ready to go fish. And we don't have any account of what Jesus' words are to these two disciples, just that Jesus spoke to them. But these two disciples, they left. They left their father. They left their father. And they chose to follow him. And it's with these disciples that Jesus begins his work of teaching and healing that happens throughout the region. Now, it's probably good that the gospel writers start with these particular stories of call because not everybody responds to Jesus' call in this way. Not everybody throws their nets down and go and follow. These first ones, they did that. But there were others that bargained with Jesus. There were other people when Jesus called them and said, why don't you choose to come and follow me that said, please let me go and bury my father first. And that was something that back in those days was not something that had anything to do with the funeral procession. That was an oath and a responsibility that people had. So for all we know, this man's father was still living and could have been living for 10, 20, 30 more years before he died and was buried. And he said, let me take care of this obligation before I choose to follow you. Luke's gospel says that there were others who said, please just let me say goodbye to my family first before I come and, and follow you. And Jesus' response to everyone, whether they choose to follow immediately or they become people full of excuses, is this. You have to choose. You have to choose if you're going to be all in or don't follow me at all. Just go do your own thing. And that's what's so amazing to me about these first disciples of Jesus. They were trained fishermen. Trained fishermen. This is what they had spent their entire lives preparing to do. This was all that they expected. And this is the response that they give to Jesus. They leave their nets. They leave their boats. They leave their livelihood. They leave their parents behind. And they follow him. And that is what faith takes to leave everything behind to follow. And they make it look so easy, don't they? 
But discipleship isn't easy. These men who responded in this way to this call of of Jesus, they struggled to fully follow Jesus. They, They didn't understand his mission. They didn't understand what he was trying to accomplish. They were trying to, even these sons of Zebedee, were trying to jockey for position as to who was going to sit on Jesus' left hand and who was going to sit on his right hand. They wanted to know who was going to be the greatest among them. They were people who fell asleep when it counted most to Jesus. They were the people that denied him. They were the people that were full of fear instead of faith. And thank goodness their stories didn't end there. Because these same disciples who faltered in their call to ministry were gifted by the Holy Spirit to preach and to teach and to heal. They were gifted by the Holy Spirit with resolve to follow Jesus at all costs, even the cost of their life. They were gifted by the Holy Spirit with courage to step forward and to lead people with boldness. They were gifted by the Holy Spirit to birth churches that carry on Jesus' ministry today throughout the world. We often do not like to admit our weaknesses. We'd like to say that we would be like those first disciples who said yes, and they dropped everything and they followed. But you know what? Even I didn't do that. I went to school to be a music teacher because I also didn't learn anything from my mother in 32 years of teaching that maybe I shouldn't do that. But I went to school to be a music teacher and then God was calling me and I was trying to, to listen to that call and so I said, well, it makes sense if I would just go be a music minister at a church. That makes a lot of sense, right? Why don't I take this call and why don't I take my skills? Because who wants to waste the skills that you've been given, right? Who wants to hide them under a bushel basket? So I I said, I'll do that, God. And God wouldn't let go of that. I even said to God, well, God, if, if you'll let me go and teach at the college level for 20 years, then I'll go. I was one of those disciples who was bargaining with God. I'll go and I'll do whatever it is that you want me to do, but just give me 20 more years to do whatever it is that I want. You know, that doesn't work so well. You know, God tends not to let up when God wants to call you. And yet in 17 years of ministry, there have been many days where I have wanted to say, I have done what you wanted me to do, God. I'm here, I'm preaching, I'm teaching, I'm leading people, and it's exhausting work. And I did it early, so can I take it my retirement after 20 years since I bargained with you and said 20 years to begin with to teach? Can I do that? You know, there have been a number of times during this pandemic where I have wondered if God was really calling me to continue, not just to be your pastor, but to be a pastor at all. And maybe God was calling me to do something else because it's been that hard to lead people. It's been that hard to lead all of you. And I know how hard that has been There have been times where I've wanted to do anything else than this. I would rather go flip burgers at McDonald's, which says a lot for a vegetarian, than to continue to do this hard work. But the Holy Spirit will not let go of me. And what I am discovering even in these last few weeks is that God is continuing to strengthen me through the Holy Spirit to live out my call and to speak bold words of truth where we need to hear them even if we do not want to hear them. To teach us how to live out the teachings of Christ. To pastor us to be a better church than we were even before the pandemic. To worship God well. And to focus on each person who enters the doors of this place and deepening their their discipleship as they seek to live out their call 
made by Jesus Christ. So here I am, and here I stand. These disciples' stories, they are key for you and me because, you know what, if you have fallen off the bandwagon in these last 16 months, if you have been making a laundry list of excuses where you say, I don't want to wear this anymore, or I don't want to sign up, or I don't want to do this, let me be my own person, get over it! Stop trying to bargain to have Jesus bless your image of discipleship. you need to let go of your anger, let go of your need for power, and don't let your desire for control get the best of you. If you've doubted in these last 16 months that you could leave people or places or things behind, if you felt full of fear, if you failed to love your neighbor as much as you love yourself, if you've forgotten to care for one of the least of these. The good news is even the best disciples have been where you are. Even the best disciples have been there. And so I offer to you today the gift of the Holy Spirit to breathe upon each one of you, that you might recommit yourselves to following in Jesus' ways and to live out his teaching. Jesus says to each one of us today, Follow me. Not 20%. Not when it feels convenient for me. Not when I get my way. But drop everything and follow me. So make the choice to do so with all that you have and all that you are. Amen. Second week in a row, I need a shower and services. I'll be so glad when the bathrooms are done in the basement and they have showers and I can go rinse off and do a wardrobe change in between services. That'll be great. <laughs> I want to invite you to join with me in singing uh, our song of response, which is called Two Fishermen. Makes sense, doesn't it, since we're talking about fishermen today?
Friends, I invite us at this time as we join together in sharing our joys and concerns, whether you're here in person or you are uh, watching or listening today, if you have joys or concerns you want to lift up, if you would text those to me, the number is 309-235-2697. Again, that's 309-235-2697. And as you're sending those joys and concerns in today, I want to invite us to sing, Lord, you have come to the lake shore.
Let's pray together. God, how very blessed we are to be able to gather and to worship you. Whether we're here in the sanctuary today or we're listening on our radios or we're watching on our televisions or our computers, God, we know that you are with us because wherever two or three are gathered, you're with them. And we know that you are here with us right now. We pray today, God, for all those who are a part of our congregation. We pray for them to faithfully listen to the call of your son, Jesus Christ, and to use the gifts that you have given us. Help us to not shy away from that call, but to follow in your footsteps. God, we pray for those who travel this weekend and for those who will be traveling, that you would watch over them and protect them. We pray as well for those who are recovering from recent surgeries and procedures. We pray that you would lay your healing hand upon them and to bring them the wholeness that they need. We pray especially today for Curtina Carter as she continues to recover from her surgery and from other complications. God, we pray for the world that you love. We know as we look at the world that it's not the way that you intended it to be, that we have sometimes lost our way um, as your people, that we've sometimes lost our way as nations and as the world. Call us once again, God, to care for the least of these, to care for those who are hungry and those who are thirsty, for those who are sick, for those who are widowed and orphaned, for those who have the greatest need but are often overlooked because we are so busy doing the things that we want in our own lives. You call us to follow you. We don't want to follow you halfway, God, and even sometimes we find it difficult to follow you at 20% or 80% of our lives. Help us to turn our lives completely to you and to have everything that we say and everything that we do show your love to the world. We offer our prayers today in Jesus' name. And together we pray as he taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we come to our time of offering this morning, um, I do want to share with you that are here in the sanctuary that there are baskets located outside, right outside the sanctuary here by the doors where you can drop off your offering. You can also go to our church website and uh, www. or I'm sorry, www.robinsonfumc.org, and you can find information there if you want to give online. I was thinking the past few days what I would like to share with you um, at the time of offering, and I'm so grateful that our church offers so many different Bible studies and we have Sunday school, um, vacation Bible schools coming up, just a lot of different ways that we're able to better study the Word of God. And I wanted to tie into, on that note, since it's Father's Day, um, I've shared before, my father died when I was um, in high school. My mother worked at Weber Insurance and Realty. She was a bookkeeper there. And Bob Birdie, as many of you know and remember, 
he and Jeanette were there. And after my father died, there was, and I'm, I was young, so I don't fully understand it, but my brother and I and my mother had to go meet with a lady who represented the insurance carrier for the railroad. And there was some discrepancy and some questions. And Bob Birdie came with the three of us. And I don't remember a lot of that, what went on. I just remember him being there and him being such a strong presence. You know, and I knew that he cared about our family. And then when we began coming to church here, one of the first people I met at the door was Bob. And then I got to be in Bible studies with Bob, worship with Bob. And I know that he loved the word and to study the word. And then at his memorial service, it just all came together because he wanted the story of the Good Samaritan shared. And I think about his life and the things that he did for me and my family. And when I came here and I saw him, I knew my family would be loved and cared for. And I don't know who inspired Bob as a child to love the word, who taught him the story of the Good Samaritan, but I'm so thankful for whoever that was. And I just want to encourage all of us to study the word, to love other people, to just, when Bob was with us, when he went to meet with the insurance person, he never said the name of Jesus. But Jesus was with us. So as you give your offering this morning, be thankful for all the learning ministries that we have in our church.
Father, we thank you so much for everything that you have given us. Please bless our offerings. Thank you for our earthly fathers and for those who have been like fathers to us throughout our life. Thank you most of all for your son, Jesus, and it's in his blessed name I pray. All right, our closing song is Where He Leads Me, and we invite you to sing as me good Methodists lustily, as John Wesley says. So sing with great courage and conviction.
You may be seated for the, the benediction today. I wanted to, to say that it was a few years ago now that the, the coordinator of higher education and campus ministry for our conference came up to me at a meeting that I was attending and she said, what's going on in Robinson? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> what, what's going on in Robinson? And she said, well, what, what do you all do in your church? Because there, there, there's got to be like something in the water or something like that because people in your church, are, wh when we read their scholarship applications and we, we find out about what they're doing, uh, it, th there's just something that you're doing in your church that's right because people are following their call. You know what? I want to come out of this pandemic and still have people say that about this church that people are continuing to follow their call. When Jesus calls us, we're supposed to respond. We're supposed to leave our nets. We're supposed to follow. And I think that there are some of us, while not all of you are called to stand up here and do what it is that I am doing, although Colby, I think you might be. Don't be afraid, man. But I'm gonna speak that pronouncement over your life right now. And you, you just do with it what you will. If you want to run like I did, you run as far as you want to, but you can be like Jonah and Nineveh, and you know what? You'll still end up doing it anyway. But, but I still think that all of us are called to do ministry, and all of us are called to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. And I hope that this week you will take that call seriously, and you will respond to what God is calling you to do and to be a part of the ministry of this church for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of the world.